Um, anyway, so thank you everyone for coming here. Um, we decided to do this webinar on uh, the Russia-Ukraine war in the context of Exculture, so the Exculture's story. As you probably know, we have uh, many participants from Ukraine, several universities, uh, dozens of students every semester, but also some of our administrative team members are in Ukraine, such as Julia, Volodymyr, Yev before that. And so the war had a profound impact on Exculture, on our administrative team, we had to make a lot of difficult decisions, uh, rearrange our workflows. And so we would like to share that story with, with you today. We also invited a few um, ex-culture, um, in a way, family members and partners, but also uh, people who have uh, jobs as professors, as deans, as teachers uh, in different parts of Ukraine and Poland. They will also share how the war had an impact on education systems uh, where they are, both in terms of ex-culture, but also schools and universities in general. So I'll, I'll turn the microphone to Tim Muth and Rafael Tomashiro, the hosts for today. Um, so uh, Tim Muth is the professor at Florida, International, uh, Florida Institute of Technology in the United States, and Rafael Tomashiro is in Brazil, and he is in charge of our Exculture Academy program, managing basically the chief operations officer for the program. So Tim, Rafael, please. Okay. Thank you, Vas. So as was mentioned, I'm from Brazil and I'm uh, responsible for Exculture Academy. And I'll be helping uh, Tim uh, with uh, hosting this webinar. And if you guys have any questions, feel free, feel free to type in the chat or in the Q&A. I'll be monitoring the questions to ask the guest speakers, okay? Now I pass the mic to Tim. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Voss. And my name is Tim Muth, and as Voss said, I'm at the Florida Institute of Technology, which is in Melbourne, Florida. And uh, I'd like to say good evening, good morning, good afternoon. And my friends around the world, thank you for joining this, uh, this webinar. And as Voss mentioned, we've got several speakers lined up, and the speakers are going to talk about five to 10 minutes each. We want to save a lot of time at the end for questions. And we've got uh, folks from, from Val and Julia will talk about the administration of exculture. Voss will add his perspective. Then we have uh, Artem, a dean from uh, EPRO. And we've got a couple of uh, faculty members from various parts of Ukraine and one from Poland. So we get to see different perspectives of what's going on in, uh, from an exculture standpoint in Ukraine and in Poland. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Julia and Val, if you were there. You want to share your experiences first? So those of you who don't know, Julia is the um, administrator um, and administrator, executive assistant for Exculture, and Vol is our um, um, basically chief technical officer. So all the IT goes through him. Julia, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for your endless support, for all of your emails asking how are we. Um, yesterday, I moved from Poland to home. I live in Vivna, in Western Ukraine. And uh, last month, me and my four, year old, four years old daughter was in evacuation. We lived in Poland. Uh, thanks God, we have some savings and we didn't register as refugees like hundreds, thousands and millions of women and children do. Um, it was hard to leave everything that I love and uh, pack whole my life and whole my kids stuff in one, um, in one backpack, in one bag. And uh, in the beginning of the war, we um, didn't ever know, will we come back or not? It was, it's a horrible experience for everybody who might leave their homes uh, because of uh, constant threat of air damage attacks because of air damage alarms few times daily. Uh, they make everybody scared because you never know where a bomb will fall, will, will fall next time. Our region is uh, relatively safe. Uh, it's um, Western part, but we left our home months ago is um, about um, because of um, 
the high risk of invasion from Belarus because my hometown is a uh, less than two hours by car from Belarus. Uh, now, when risk is lower, we make decision to come home. But in my car, every day and every minute, I have the bag with with my luggage. In my bag, every time when I live in home, I have documents and uh, some money. So in every second, I'm ready to take my daughter and run. <sighs> Our town now is um, like big volunteer hub. And um, first weeks, every work for everybody was paralyzed because we took everything from our home and give it to the volunteers and make uh, shelters for refugees from Kyiv, from Eastern regions. And now our re region, our hometown is full of refugees. So everybody tries to help as much as they can with clothes, with uh, food, with dishes, with everything. We are sorting meds and making some packages to send them near the front line. We are sharing our flats to give the shelter for refugees to have a place to sleep. Uh, it's a horrible experience to know that few kilometers from your home is a war line. And news daily are shocking because Russians uh, are killing Ukrainians daily. Our military forces doing their best, but it, it's war and it's a scary thing. Talking about our work uh, balance, few first weeks we was paralyzed and stressed. We can't finish to our early track. So thank you Vas and Rafael for handling this. But uh, when shock finished and when we begin understanding the processes that war line can't come in our house in a minute, that uh, we need to monitor the situation daily and hourly, but we need to make our daily work to support army, to support volunteers, to get money and to get the bridge to our normal life. So exactly for me, my uh, uh, work uh, and my daily uh, processes that I handle in culture, it's like a small bridge to that life that we lost because of Russia, because of war. And I know that mission of culture is to make world better. We are showing for different countries, for different cultures that we can work together, even if we are far each from other in a thousand of kilometers, we can do great things. We need to learn how to work with each other, how to support each other, but it will not work with invaders. And it's horrible to understand that in a highly technology world, it's still possible to stroke in other country by rockets just because you want it. So um, wall is not here, sorry about it because uh, we still need to be good parents and um, our daughter is sleeping now and she's waiting with her while she's asleep. <sighs> our kids are playing in war. Our kids um, living in stress and um, the place to run out from stress, it's uh, playing. So everybody in Ukraine are playing in war. Everywhere in every region, we are under pressure every second. But we are still standing. We uh, understand uh, all our support from all over the world and it's it's incredible to 
to, to see how everybody is supporting us with money, with armor, with defense. And I think when the whole world is against one country, the victory is near. So uh, I hope that soon we will make the call together just to celebrate the, the victory, the peace. And I, I think that it's not Russia and Ukrainian war. It's a world war because you will never know what will be next if we will fall. But we won't. Thank you, everybody. Julia, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Voss, would you like to uh, speak next? Uh, yes. So um, I would like to share um, how Exculture was affected by the war in the three main areas. So first and foremost, the administration side. Um, so as you know, um, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, Volodymyr was hired uh, to help with all of the data and IT related work. And then we also had uh, Julia join the team. Uh, it's been about three years, I believe. Uh, and so she handles um, all of them, essentially all of the daily operations, emails, um, uh, weekly reminders, things like that. Plus, uh, I have a strong Ukrainian connection and Ola, my wife, helps uh, with uh, some things as well, uh, obviously also has a Ukrainian connection. And so when the whole mess started, I remember, um, you know, most of the, uh, January and February, uh, all of the news were talking about the impeding, uh, about the uh, Lumen invasion. And so I remember a day before the invasion, we were talking to Julia and she sort of joked and she said, well, in 2014, uh, Ukrainians were panicking and the whole world uh, was expressing concerns. And then in 2022, the whole world is panicking, but Ukrainians are sort of used to it and they're expressing concerns, sort of basically nobody cares. And then next morning, the whole bombard bombardment started, um, pretty much every major city was bombed. And then that's when the whole uh, workflows of Excultures uh, started broken down. So Julia would be putting in basically a full work day every day, Volodymyr almost every day. I would put in uh, most of my day on you know, into Excalture. All the helps from time to time. And so with the war, Julia is obviously basically in the bomb shelter with wall. Um, I, uh, for the first several weeks, uh, you know, it's very difficult to focus on work uh, when, you know, you call your parents or you call Julia for that matter. Uh, and sometimes they're not available they're in the bomb shelter. Sometimes the internet goes off. Uh, and then you obviously, you know, compulsively check new the news. Uh, we installed the apps on the phones that show uh, which parts of the country have been bombed at this time. So, you know, every few hours you get the aerial attack warning. And uh, so obviously that makes it very difficult to focus on work. So I think we held the line and uh, pretty much all of the things were still done on the administrative front uh, for Exculture, uh, weekly uh, performance reviews, uh, final report evaluations, uh, everything, you know, all the correspondence emails, uh, but uh, it was all of a sudden much, much more effort, at least on my side, given that the whole you know, operations process has been a little bit disrupted. And so thanks so much to our partners in other countries like Rafael, Drew, uh, Leon, uh, Dr. B, uh, Tim. So everybody was helping as much as they could. And so we were able to um, sort of hold the line, although again, it was not leaving much time for anything else. So my apology to everyone uh, right away if any of the correspondence was late or some of the things were done late. Um, Another thing or sort of big issue for me was um, what to do uh, with um, our partners in Russia. So um, the whole war started about 10 days before the late track war about to start. And we had uh, three, if I remember correctly, uh, universities from Russia scheduled to participate. <laughs> As you know, um, uh, or maybe you don't know, I'll share with you. Uh, so um, I believe uh, in, in, in Exculture's mission, uh, of building bridges. So our motto is connecting cultures. And uh, so uh, we place people not only from different countries into the same teams, but we also uh, measure extensively uh, what effect it has on people's attitudes, motivations, cultural intelligence, stereotypes, interest in working with one another and so on and so on. And uh, we have empirical evidence that uh, from before to after 
when people work together in one team, different people, uh, people, people from different countries, they are more interested in one another, fewer stereotypes, uh, more motivation to work together. And so for all these uh, 12 years or so, I've been deliberately placing on the same teams people, for example, from India and Pakistan, from, from uh, Palestine and Israel, from Israel and Arab states, and from Ukraine and Russia. So my, I saw my mission in uh, both connecting the cultures, but also providing opportunities for people to interact. We also have had uh, quite a few professors actively involved in, in X culture, both from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so we had, uh, I, I will not be naming names here now, uh, we don't want to get them in trouble, but we had some professors who wrote papers with us, uh, who attended the Exculture Symposia, who co-organized some of those events. And again, I saw my mission, among other things, in sort of exposing them more to the West, to the Western values, and in a way sort of helping them become more pro-West and perhaps less pro-Putin. Uh, so now we found ourselves in a situation where we have several universities scheduled to participate. And I will tell you that on the one hand, I thought, okay, that's my chance to build those bridges when everybody sort of hates each other. At the same time, it is very difficult uh, to, to sort of to build bridges when your parents are literally in the bomb shelter. Moreover, it's even more difficult to sort of stay cold headed when uh, the person who is managing your emails and who's basically, you know, will get in the names of, you know, the students in the roster and everything, Julia in this case particularly, is literally being under, you know, uh, under the Russian bombs. Uh, another concern obviously was that uh, what will happen to the students from Russia uh, when they are in teams, given the not the most positive sort of views of the Russians at this time in different countries. So it was a difficult decision for me and I resisted for a while, but eventually I sent uh, long letter letters to our ex uh, uh, Russian colleagues saying that, sorry guys, but this semester you will not be able to participate. And then literally next day I get an email from my dean uh, who says that the university made the decision to sever all the ties with any Russian universities and institutions. And if we are planning to, we have to go through a special review process. So even if that decision hadn't been made, uh, we would have not had many you know, options here. Now, I did talk to all of those professors. They seem to be very much anti-Putin. And so uh, I'm still sort of, you know, not, not, not sure what to think about it given the, given the circumstances. But anyway, we made the decision not to allow them to participate this semester. Another thing that we did uh, was um, sort of one of my friends uh, that we went to school together contacted me saying that it was like week two, maybe week three of the war, saying that um, my kids are essentially in the bomb shelter, uh, the schools are closed, uh, they have nothing to do. Uh, maybe you can find someone in uh, your network, maybe your own kids, who can talk to my kids in English. And so this way they will practice English at least a little bit. And um, uh, so, and uh, you know, it will be some form of education and some, you know, sense of normalcy in their life. And then next day, another friend asks for the same thing. And so I sent out an email through the Exculture, uh, through the Exculture um, uh, network asking if anyone would like to talk to those kids and basically, you know, allow them to practice English, share their stories, but, you know, maybe you want to learn more about, about uh, uh, kids in Ukraine at this time. And to my surprise, quite a few people responded and so at that time I thought, hey, if we have some more volunteers than just those two families need, let's uh, invite more Ukrainians. So I placed an, uh, a post uh, on my Facebook page, uh, first asking if anyone would be interested and then yes, you're invited. And so we got quite a few applications at this time. Uh, Leon Mascara is here, the uh, teenager, well, teenager, she's 18, who's helping me manage the program. So she would have the more precise numbers, but it's a little over 500 people at this time in this program that for now we call Penpel Ukraine. So uh, we got uh, a little over 100 Ukrainians, if I remember correctly, who signed up for the program, and then uh, about 400 people from other countries. So basically every Ukrainian can have uh, four or five uh, pen pals. Originally we uh, envisioned it as a program for kids and advertised it only as teenage for teenagers, but then we did get some applications from kids as young as eight and nine. And then we also got some inquiries, uh, something like, you know, I have a 52 year old kid, can he participate as a joke, but you know, an adult wanted to participate. And so since we had a lot of applicants of older age uh, from other countries, we basically opened it for all ages. So at this time we have uh, several hundred people participating in this program. And again, our hope here is that 
uh, you know, it's not only a way for Ukrainians to, to practice English, but also, uh, you know, to feel supported for other people to express their support, but also again, to forge those relationships, friendships that hopefully will help them uh, not only to uh, survive through this, you know, difficult time, but also uh, maybe those relationships will lead to, I don't know, business partnerships, research partnerships uh, in the future, or simply more compassion, more understanding of what's going on so that something like this will not happen in the future. Even if we reduce the chance of that by a couple of percent, I, I, I still think that it's a worthwhile program. So those are some of the things that um, I've experienced from my point of view here. And uh, so, um, um, yeah, I guess we are holding up. It's much more difficult than the last semester, but it seems like we're keeping everything more or less on time uh, with uh, some delays, but not as much. Um, so hopefully everything will be going fine for the rest of the semester. Thank you for the update, Voss. Appreciate that. Um, up next is Artem. Do you like to give us an update, Artem, please? If I may just to say, so Artem is, um, we went to college together and um, he is now the Dean of the Faculty or School of Economics and Management at Dnipro Technical University. So uh, one of the biggest universities in central Ukraine. So he is much, much closer to the front lines than, than, than our other partners in the West. So he's literally here in the bombs every day. Please Artem. Yeah, thank you. So hello everybody. Good morning or oh, good afternoon uh, to your friends. And uh, my name is Artem Bardos. I'm a Dean of uh, Scientific and Research Institute of Economics. It's kind of business economic school of economics, we may say, of uh, Dnipro University of Technology. Uh, DUT. Uh, well, and um, in our region, uh, we uh, live in a quite area zone. Uh, we may call it peaceful because the front line uh, is about uh, in in uh, about uh, 120, I think, kilometers from us the nearest uh, zone. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we constantly uh, uh, we constantly uh, can feel uh, that fact that war is close because uh, the last few days uh, the air alarms are, are repeating in every uh, 50, 60 minutes and last for uh, for an hour and more. Uh, our city now seems uh, a little bit uh, uh, more peaceful even than two weeks uh, before because many uh, trading uh, centers are open, many cafes uh, uh, again uh, start to work, uh, many small shops um continue to work and uh, there are uh, again you can see uh, people in the streets but there are a big difference because uh, i think uh, about 50% uh, of those people who can meet in the city it's not our inhabitants but it's refugees from the uh, other regions like uh, donetsk uh, luhansk uh, and kharkiv and kharkiv uh, who fled from the war, and um, uh, we in our university we uh, receive and resettle refugees in our dormitories. Uh, we try to maintain order in, uh, on our campus at night because we help people who come to our uh, shelters uh, during the uh, alar <coughs> alarms. Uh, the situation is changing constantly. Uh, first uh, weeks of uh, the war, people uh, come to shelters uh, every time they had a siren. But uh, now is the uh, 45th day and uh, uh, people uh, uh, start to behave a little bit um, lightly, yeah. It means uh, a little careless. People become a little careless about air, air alarms. 
Uh, but it depends because after each series of missile attacks, uh, when uh, these missile attacks uh, are successful for the enemy, un unfortunately, uh, more and more people come to shelters. Uh, of course, uh, the seek of the shelters is another problem because uh, first weeks people try to find uh, these shelters in uh, basements of the block of the flats, but uh, after Mariupol and uh, after uh, Kiev suburb Borodanka, photo uh, was spread out and we saw the uh, ruins of the big uh, buildings uh, and uh, we understood that many people who were in the basement, they were buried alive. Uh, people mostly stay in their homes. So uh, nine, I think now 90% of our uh, people in our city, they just go to the corridors and wait there. So it's all in the bathrooms because these two places are considered as the more or less safety. Uh, and uh, this is about the um, uh, situation in the city. Uh, about the uh, challenges, uh, there are two of them. Uh, first challenge uh, for us as a university is the uh, is uh, is the uh, uh, our international connection. Uh, considering our relations with the Russians, I may say that we ended them in uh, 2014 after the occupation of Crimea. Uh, we had uh, a strong relations with them, uh, historical relations, we may say, but. Uh, almost for eight years. Yes, we uh, didn't uh, uh, cooperate with them totally. Uh, and after the start of the war uh, on February 24, we uh, as a university left several international associations like uh, Eurasian uh, uh, Association of Universities, uh, uh, because uh, in this association, Russian universities have traditionally uh, has uh, uh, strong positions, and uh, these associations preferred not to notice war and war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, among the challenges for Ukrainian universities, I think the biggest challenge will be to recruit applicants in the summer of 2022, uh, because due to the wartime, uh, there is a sequestration of the state budget it's clear because we need to redistribute expenditures on defense needs and reduct uh, our expenditures on education, unfortunately, but it's uh, uh, true. And uh, we have the so-called mixed system when uh, part of our students are paid uh, from the state budget and uh, the rest uh, pay uh, by themselves. Uh, but uh, many students uh, are unable now to pay because businesses have stopped, stopped operating. Uh, they, with their families, moved uh, to other regions or moved abroad. And uh, it's, uh, it caused a financial problems in many Ukrainian high schools. I didn't even say about those universities which are occupied are destroyed because I know that in uh, uh, Ukrainian city of uh, Melitopol, it's a uh, county center uh, in the uh, Zaporizhia Oblast, uh, which is occupied by Russians uh, since the, I think, 25th, 26th of February. So in this uh, city of Melitopol, uh, Russians seek uh, uh, for uh, professors from uh, local uh, pedagogical university and try to find them because uh, they believe that uh, in uh, universities and schools uh, our youth, youth hmm, our girls and boys were uh, taught to hate Russia and uh, they uh, think that uh, being a teacher, being a professor uh, means uh, 
to be a dangerous person for the occupation uh, power. Uh, we know that uh, many universities, such as Mariupol State University, are totally destroyed, and only few of the professors uh, uh, were lucky enough to flee from the city because it was uh, totally blocked. Well, but for the whole Ukrainian uh, education system, yeah, the main problems uh, are, are will be. Uh, connected with the uh, recruitment process uh, with the uh, so we, we have such a term as a brain drain you know and uh, we understand that uh, this summer we shall have a student's brain because uh, many of our uh, potential students uh, will choose any other destinations uh, probably in the western Ukraine probably uh, in the eastern Europe uh, but not in such traditional academic centers as Kharkiv, uh, as Kyiv, and probably as Dnipro too. So it's also uh, a kind of uh, challenge for our universities. Uh, what else? Uh, just a few words. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like uh, to say uh, about uh, the possibility which is opened uh, by this war for the X culture. Unfortunately, according to the statistics, uh, most of the Ukrainians, I think 74 of them, have never left the regions where uh, they lived. And now uh, on this uh, tragic uh, background, on these terrible events, we see the situation when uh, almost uh, 8 million of people moved from their regions to another region. So it's kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, opening the culture and the mixing the cultures within Ukraine and uh, within uh, Eastern Europe. Of course, uh, it would be better to do it in the other circumstances. But in uh, and it's uh, kind of it's a very interesting cultural phenomenon because uh, we see how the people from the totally different regions meet, meet each other and collaborate. So it's uh, what, uh, what uh, it's all what I uh, wish to say briefly. Thank you. I'm sorry for my long speech. No, Artem, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We understand completely. And uh, Oleg, well, if you'd come on next, and Oleg, if you would introduce yourself when you come on and then uh, tell us about your background. Again, if I may, Oleg uh, has participated in some of the Exculture Symposia. He is one of the first uh, school teachers who joined Exculture with younger participants. And so now he's in charge of several projects related to education in Lviv, uh, the Western Ukraine that is now the recipient of most of the displaced uh, people from Eastern Ukraine. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Vas. It's been a big pleasure for me. And uh, I'm pleased to see even some familiar names, familiar faces here. Sometimes uh, from Calgary, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so my name is Oleg, and I am a teacher of economics and history at a local school in Lviv. And I also combine this job with my position at uh, Lviv IT Cluster. It's an association, it's a special organization of main uh, IT companies, local IT companies, uh, which develops, uh, which develop IT sphere in Lviv and mainly develop uh, IT education, secondary and higher education. Um, so how the education sphere in Lviv uh, is functioning now in war conditions. Um, to make long story short, our education shows good amount of, you know, adaptivity, flexibility. Uh, Lviv, as many hours, our regions of Ukraine successfully adopted 
for work conditions. I can uh, say it clearly now. Uh, if we are talking about local universities, uh, most of them uh, have restarted online, online education process, I believe in the middle of March. Um, of course, that universities are aware that uh, far from all students are ready to continue studying right, right now. Uh, a lot of students did not settle in uh, yet or don't have uh, technical equipment. Uh, some of the students are refugees, of course. Uh, that's why the approach, you know, is uh, very liberal for now. Uh, the main point is next. If you have to study, uh, you have to study or uh, you have to be useful in any other way to help to win the war. For example, uh, students uh, at the cybersecurity department of Lviv Polytechnic uh, are deeply engaged in cyber war with Russia. Uh, it's obvious that uh, these students may not find enough time, you know, to attend all the lectures and seminars. Uh, but uh, I know that Lviv Polytechnic stated directly that uh, to the students that via cyber activity uh, now will ensure good marks uh, in the future, at the end of the semester in June. So basically, students now have very advanced, you know, practic experience, practic course on cybersecurity uh, with the real enemy. Uh, the same situation with students who are studying international relations. We have to communicate abroad to tell the truth about Russia aggression to Ukraine. I know also that students at the history department at Ivan Franco University research deeply current events as well, and they engage in information campaigns as well. So uh, as you see, it's not more about Marx now, but the main point is to help our country to win the war. And um, I can say also about schools, some words. Uh, the teaching process at schools was interrupted only for a week or two, uh, right after the start of Russia invasion. Now students attend classes, but obviously they do it online. The online form is the only option uh, for now. Uh, not only because of direct military actions and air alerts, uh, but also uh, because of a new way of using schools. Some local schools became shelters for refugees, for example, my school. Um, so yeah, only online education process for now, but it's more or less effective, I believe. Uh, so I can say that schools, uh, some universities, and even some local businesses, for example, IT business, uh, have been transformed in order to host refugees and help them to settle in. And of course, uh, we are talking not about housing, but also about food, about medical equipment assistance, uh, psychological assistance, and so on. So yeah, it's, I believe the main, basically the main information. Uh, if you have any questions, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. Thank, yeah. thank what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold the questions to the end. I'm sure there's tons of them. And while you're speaking, as you're looking at the, uh, the chat board, um, every, everyone I think on this call and around the world is, is strongly supporting Ukrainians and uh, we wish you the best, but thank you for that update. And now we'll move along to Natalia. And I think we have two Natalias. Natalia uh, from Kiev, are you with us? I think she's not. I don't see her among us. Uh, I am I am here. Oh, yeah, she, she's here. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm a little bit late. Uh, I'm sorry. I had some no. problems with connection, but looks like I was uh, exactly in time. You got it. Uh, Maybe you can introduce yourself first, Natalia, and then... Tell us about your situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm Natalia Kochkim. I'm representing uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev. Uh, uh, that is the capital of Ukraine. I know now nobody, everybody knows not that Kiev is just the capital of Ukraine, but I suppose that people are very well acquainted with even the districts uh, within Kiev. So that is an incredible thing, I suppose. Uh, so what what is uh, what is going on in the in our educational sphere? Uh, I am also coordinating the double degree with the University of Macerata in Italy. And I am the um, collaborator uh, with uh, some other Italian universities, University in Sardinia, uh, University of Cagliari, University of Cassina, and Southern uh, Lazio. Uh, so we are, uh, I mean, we, uh, like my department, are mainly working with Italian universities. And what we see now is uh, great efforts that uh, Italy is doing towards Ukraine, lots of meetings lots of events, lots of possibilities open for uh, the students, mostly for students, uh, some for uh, university professors, mm, uh, lots of master programs or some funding uh, for the students, for Ukrainian students, for example, for those who are involved in the, the double degree, uh, they have the possibility of gaining some money. We were not talking about lots of money, but uh, still, like 1,500 for them is lots of money to, to spend in Macerata in Italy. So, uh, but this situation, uh, I, I understand that uh, all the world is now standing uh, with Ukraine and we're very much grateful for that. And all the challenges that we are not facing and the main challenge, I don't know if my colleagues were talking about it, uh, with the whole educational system in Ukraine will be the enrollment campaign that will start in uh, September. Because now for, for sure we have our students and uh, we hope that uh, the students that we have now will uh, finish, will graduate with us. Anyway, if uh, before uh, there was a huge let's say problem for them uh, to go to study abroad, meaning that they were physically uh, in Ukraine, they were physically in Kiev. Now, most of them are physically in Europe. And having all those fundings from European, from uh, the United States universities, uh, on one hand, they are helping our students on another hand, they are creating huge risks for uh, Ukrainian universities because actually we are losing our students. And considering that fact, uh, uh, my, uh, I think that uh, these double degrees may be the possibility to remain our students in uh, uh, Ukraine. That is what I'm thinking. Some sorts of collaborations, mutual collaborations, because otherwise uh, we, will, we have the great risk to start the 1st of September with absolutely empty uh, master programs, especially the, the programs of the first year master. And uh, um, with bachelor, I don't think so, because the majority of uh, students who are enrolling in bachelor, they are under 18. So I didn't think that the parents will be ready to send them to study abroad. I think that they will try to maintain them in Ukraine. But for master, uh, we are suffering all those years. I see here Artem Bardas uh, from another huge university and uh, huge big universities in Ukraine were suffering by years by losing students. The better we educate the students, the huger we had the risk of losing them and moving them to study them uh, abroad. And now with the war, I don't know what to expect. So thank you very much. Uh, this is like my small comment. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and I'm sorry for my delay. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much. I just want to comment that I, I liked your nails with the Ukrainian. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, for sure. <laughs> I'm physically now uh, in Italy, so I'm moving, I'm educating people. So my kids are studying physically in the uh, Italian school.
So now, like all Italy, at least this uh, city, they know where Ukraine is. Uh, so they are talking about the friendship. Or they know exactly how the Ukrainian flag looks like. So they are very well educated <laughs> from that point of view. Unfortunately, uh, we needed the war to get the world well educated. Thank you very much, Natalia. Maybe now we can pass the mic to Natalia Popovich. Can you please introduce yourself? Again, I can do a quick introduction. Okay. So Natalia again participated several times in Exculture as a teacher with high school students and as a professor with the students from her university. She's also in Poland uh, that has now received uh, over 3 million Ukrainians. And uh, so kind of sees firsthand not only impact on education specifically, but also on the whole infrastructure in general. So Poland has been the closest Ukrainian ally from day one. And uh, maybe Natalia can share with us a little bit more about that experience. So as was said, uh, we have over 4 million refugees from Ukraine in Europe and 2.6 of them cross the border with Poland. And um, even I checked yesterday, it was 28,000 refugees. Uh, 28,000 refugees came to Poland only yesterday. But from this 2.6 million people, um, there are estimation that one and um, 1.5 of them are stay in Poland because some of them went to the other European countries to the West, and uh, some of them came back to Ukraine um, in different reasons. And uh, it is also very very um, new times for Poland because. Poland has the largest population in its history. It's around 40 million people. And uh, the problem is there, there are a lot of uh, women with children. And the problem is that 30, 40% of men who work in, who, who used to work in Poland in construction, in transport, in some blue color, they went to Ukraine for, fight, for fighting with Russia. And um, of course, uh, schools and university, uh, universities are open for refugees. And a lot of universities uh, made available dormitories for refugees. They collect food all the time, publish on public websites, uh, current needs. They conduct, of course, charity concerts, with food raising for refugees, and also uh, give jobs uh, for lecture for science from Ukraine. And of course, they support the students. Uh, and with my observation, in Poland, we don't have a lot of students. Probably it's connected with the middle of this um, student year. Um, we will see what will be uh, next year, like um, this academic year. But the huge challenge and the biggest challenge is primary schools. Because as um, Alex said, um, in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine, we have some. They have online classes, so probably as, um, older older students. I mean, 15 years old, 16 years old. They use of this uh, possibility, but little children like uh, like um, um, in kindergartens, in primary schools, so children from six to 14. Uh, they, of course, uh, want to come to, to schools and um, official information that there is 162,000 Ukrainian children in Polish schools. And in secondary schools, children, um, the, the biggest amount of these children are in Warsaw, in Krakow, so I mean, generally in big cities, and number of these children in classes is maximum. Uh, Polish teachers, of course, do not want to polonize Ukrainian children, but they also cannot teach uh, in Ukrainian language. And um, some, some schools try to open prepare, um, some classes with additional Polish language or try to create a new classes uh, in, in Ukraine. So they try to find some Ukrainian teachers and open Ukrainian classes but again, it's the middle of a school year, so it's hard to do that, but we will see again what will be next year. 
And uh, I think also the big challenge is um, the problems with final exams. So with final exams after primary school or secondary school, um, because Poland cannot prepare it in Ukrainian. Uh, of course, some, uh, some students can try to learn Polish language and can try to pass it, but of course it's not fair enough uh, to pass exam in new language. Uh, so uh, big challenges, big changes also for, for Polish people, for Polish government. And yeah, and uh, it is necessary to have um, some bridges with Ukraine to create a better education in Poland for Ukrainian, for people from Ukraine. And that's all. Natalia, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing for the Ukrainian people and especially the children. Uh, Vas, I think I saw the Gregory Who's, who's yes, we have from, Odessa. from Estonia and Greg uh, with ties to Odessa. So maybe they can briefly share their views just a minute before we go to Q&A. Okay. So um, Gregory, you want to go first? You there? Uh, I, I think we need to add him. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I'm just promoting him right now. Yeah. Thanks, Raphael. Hello, Ger Gregory. Can you hear us? You can open your mic. Yeah, I think his microphone is muted. <clears throat> okay, and now yeah. uh, we can hear you now, Greg. Yes. Okay, can you see me? Yes, yes. we can. Hello. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thanks for the bottom of my heart to all panelists. Uh, sharing your experience is so important. Uh, I'm a native of Odessa in the third generation, but uh, almost 30 years ago, I moved to the United States and uh, I didn't speak uh, Ukrainian probably since then. So I lost most of this up until recently when I started reading daily uh, news from Ukraine, of course, in Ukrainian, because I started speaking Ukrainian and English at the age of six and uh, uh, for most of my life, it was not a uh, difference. Uh, there was no difference, Russian, Ukrainian. Uh, well, English became, of course, the major uh, language since uh, my family moved to the United States. Uh, one of the things that, that I want to say is that I share the pain. Although, fortunately, Odessa uh, has less uh, bombarding, uh, non comparable with uh, Kharkiv, for example. But uh, there were ballistic uh, rockets that were uh, falling and uh, uh, leaving uh, large holes in the ground around Odessa. And uh, several times Russian uh, large uh, uh, ships uh, tried to, uh, to gain some, uh, some place in Odessa region and fortunately, uh, uh, fighters uh, defended uh, their uh, stood their ground and defended that. Uh, the most important part of, for me is to find for each of us the the most suitable way to support Ukraine, and uh, it is not only supporting the Ukraine as uh, the state, but also supporting Ukrainians who were deprived of their everyday lives from their happiness, from the happiness of their children, from everything that uh, they before took as a reasonable experience of, of a peaceful country. Uh, I know that uh, many people uh, donate money, donate time, donate energy, donate their talent. Uh, in my family, uh, our daughter, who is an artist and professor at uh, Parsons uh, uh, New School of Design, uh, uh, created a, a series of uh, uh, different pictures uh, using mostly uh, blue and, uh, and yellow colors. Uh, and uh, these pictures, uh, these illustrations were uh, given to the international platform Redbubble. 
uh, which uh, prints uh, upon the uh, order on everything, on uh, uh, the bags, on uh, t-shirts, on uh, notepads, on large posters and so on. And she already uh, um, delivered several thousand dollars uh, that were given to her from Redbubble to different Ukrainian charities. Uh, my uh, professional approach was uh, the main concern, and I, I heard uh, several familiar tunes from the presentations of uh, other panelists uh, about the uh, onboarding of Ukrainian students whose education was uh, uh, disrupted by the war. And uh, because I, I had an experience of teaching uh, in Europe and in the United States and in Ukraine, I uh, want to help these students get more comfortable, uh, less uh, confused with the educational system. Uh, in two days from now, I will participate in a, a charitable uh, event. It, it will be uh, an, an informal dinner uh, organized by the uh, Dean of the Sacred Heart University, <coughs> uh, which is in my vicinity, uh, for Ukrainian professors and Ukrainian students. Uh, the goal is to help them understand uh, the realities of the American educational system and feel comfortable rather than confused and uh, uh, disturbed by this. Uh, this is my, my goal, uh, contributing to, to the whole. And I want to say that based on my prior experience in X culture and uh, our dialogue with Vas uh, started many years ago when he had uh, very few, if any, white hair uh, in, in his beard and uh, on, in his, uh, his head. Uh, I, I feel that X cultures nature, uh, its philosophy, its mission are truly uh, hospitable to people from different cultures, uh, people who have uh, little understanding of uh, other countries, other economic conditions, other uh, ways of doing business around the world. And this is uh, by, by itself a very, uh, I would say, integrative mission. It is very, uh, very uh, difficult to say anything about Russia because we know that the Russian government uh, is uh, an aggressor and many people are brainwashed to a degree that they stopped thinking, they just listen to uh, the state uh, uh, media and uh, they think that this is uh, the, uh, this is a gospel. Uh, hey, hey Gregory, I, this, this is Tim, I'm, I'm sorry. We're trying to, to keep it tight so we have time for questions. Okay. Maybe, could you wrap up by about 30 seconds? We'll go to the next speaker. I will try. Thank you. What I say is that um, there are some people in Russia who are very reasonable, who risk their lives and their freedom uh, going on the street to protest against the war. Unfortunately, they are in minority and unfortunately they are suppressed and in many cases punished by jail time. What I want to say is that we, we need to support Ukrainian refugees and Ukrainians who are, are there on the ground. And we want to give them uh, our full heart and, full, uh, and fully open arms. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Gregory, for, for your perspective and thanks for all your support. And uh, then I think we had a gentleman from Estonia. Is it uh, Teek? Yes, did also participate in Exculture for many, many years as a professor and a researcher. So did, if you can share with us what's going on in Estonia in this respect. Hello, uh, greetings from Estonia and the Estonian Business School. Indeed, the uh, Baltic countries also, all uh, uh, people in Baltic countries are strongly supporting the fight of Ukraine for their freedom. And you see, if you go to some shop or medical uh, uh, shop, you can easily get some pay, make some small donation to refugees and to get some Ukraine flag. But indeed, we also donate the bigger sums of sunny money directly to uh, Ukraine armed forces through Ukraine Central Bank. 
it's also if we, you read any news in Estonia, online news, there are all, all, all the time addresses where you can donate some money for uh, Ukraine. And uh, uh, we have also uh, many uh, refugees from Ukraine, and especially uh, females with uh, small kids. Not, not so many as from po in Poland, but in Estonia, you know, we have 1.3 million people and we have around 29,000 uh, refugees from Ukraine. And uh, I would like actually to raise two questions uh, for panelists. So the first question is, now we have a dispute. We are trying to integrate Ukraine uh, kids uh, uh, just continue studies at primary school and at uh, secondary or high school. And indeed, uh, among uh, Ukraine refugees are also people who are, whose native language is Russian. And there are two you know, political views. One view is that they should be uh, strongly encouraged to go to Estonian schools, because still we have such uh, Russian-speaking schools uh, a bit separate in Estonia. And uh, others say that, okay, parents should, should uh, decide. But indeed, if we uh, get uh, uh, Ukraine refugee kids to go to Russian-speaking schools, it is possible they also are in, in place somehow to this uh, uh, Russian uh, universe of fake information which comes from some Russian minority people in Estonia. So what should be the right way? Should we uh, give complete freedom for parents to decide or should we try to direct them to Estonian schools where we also introduce some special classes in Ukraine language because we have already more than 300 Ukraine uh, teachers in Estonia. And even more complicated question is what I also posted under questions so some student public universities say that we just will uh, not accept any students from Russia during next years. But uh, is it good in, in information war to live in bunkers? Maybe we, we should at least accept these students who are expelled from Russian universities because of political activity. And maybe we should uh, get the uh, fees from Russian students and then uh, direct it to a uh, fund for giving scholarship uh, uh, to Ukraine refugee uh, students in, in our country. So I actually address this question also to our participant from uh, Finland, because I understand uh, maybe in Finland this discussion is not so uh, so first, uh, what is the right way to deal with such uh, information war and, uh, and uh, understanding uh, each other through information space? So these are very complicated questions. And indeed, I guess in uh, uh, next years, like the same questions apply for X, X culture. So what will be a role of uh, people who are Russians from Russia can they join X culture teams? Can they only join as individuals? Or uh, they can also join as representatives of some universities. So I am sorry I, I finished with such a very complicated question. And uh, just one more point. Um, by the way, Estonia was the first EU country which donated arms to Ukraine, even before the war started. And, we were not so skeptical and uh, cautious as people in Germany and in some other countries. And now all the Baltic countries, by the way, we have made arrangements to get rid of Russian oil and gas. And it is a very complicated thing for uh, such countries as Italy and Germany. So that is the real thing uh, to stop the war machine if we don't go to fight. Thank you very much. So we'll open up for questions now. Vos, do, do you want to try to handle the first question that was just asked about the future of Russian students in X culture, or do you want to keep that one for later? 
Uh, well, it's up to you, yeah. Uh, I, I don't insist, but you see, these are all uh, very topical questions now in Baltic countries. Well, regarding Keith's question as to what language should be used um, uh, for the kids, Ukrainian kids in Estonia, I really don't know the answer. I can say that there are several sort of edit, or I see several types of attitudes to Russian language among Ukrainians at this time. Yeah. So some people uh, seem to now to completely refuse to, to, to use Russian, speak Russian, listen to Russian music or movies. And I read uh, that it was similar um, after the World War II when many people uh, essentially, you know, cut off all the ties with German culture and language, including German, uh, I don't know, uh, writers, uh, 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 um, uh, poets and things, so, uh, and things like that. So uh, in Ukraine, there are some people who are like that. There are also others who believe that language has nothing to do with Mr. Putin. And so they just keep speaking Russian. Uh, there are many Russian speaking uh, defenders of Ukraine soldiers. And so they would like to separate the two points of view. Uh, so Russian language is Russian language, Russia as the country or as the uh, political system, that's a whole different thing. There are also some people who believe uh, that uh, the separation from Russia and Russian culture and Russian language is a strategically important decision for Ukraine. Um, as you may know, Russia sort of invaded Ukraine under the pretense of defending the Russian speaking population. And likewise, uh, some Ukrainians were sympathetic to Russia up until 2014 because they sort of grew up with Russian movies and Russian music. And so some people believe that it's not a matter of culture or, or, or education, but a matter of a strategic uh, sort of safety uh, and security of the country. And so I, I really don't know how to approach it. So I can tell you that um, I haven't used Russian for many, many years and uh, sort of do not feel like using Russian, even though obviously I speak Russian. Although I will also be honest when I speak to someone who doesn't speak Ukrainian, but only Russian as many Russians do, as long as the person is sort of, you know, um, respectful towards Ukraine, I will use Russian or, in, you know, invite perhaps, you know, use English. But yes, I'm a little bit more radical in this case, yeah, I guess yeah. there are probably yeah. different. So just in the student case, the question is, should there be a state direction or should it be a decision made by parents? So some of our politicians are afraid that uh, if we don't uh, directly teach to uh, student schools, uh, it will consolidate this separation of Estonian and uh, uh, Russian language uh, schools in our country. And uh, after some years, maybe these kids will be brainwashed uh, by a Russian propaganda through uh, uh, the parents of uh, Russian uh, uh, pupils at least schools. So that's one view. And the other is a more liberal view let's uh, give parents the right to decide. Yeah, I, I don't have the answer. Maybe somebody has a more specific, you know, I, I, I know what I wish, but I'm not sure if it would be the politically right decision. So therefore, yeah. um, I don't know, maybe somebody has a more definitive answer. As of me, okay. as, um, me as a parent, not even me as American, uh, is Ukrainian person, I don't want my kids to contact any uh, Russian culture before the Russian government will not change the course. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take responsibility and to mix up everything uh, just because everywhere when Russia appears, it becomes the uh, not safe region. They are coming for saving us, killing our kids. So uh, they need to change the course themselves. Ukrainians are fighting from 2014 for their freedom. We changed president, we are changing our government, we are changing our course daily. They can too. So if they will not stand up, it, no any can help them. Even if it's a propaganda machine, even uh, they are brainwashed, uh, they can change their life themselves. It's only my opinion. And uh, uh, our kid is uh, 
avoiding any Russian cartoons, any Russian songs, because we have more and more in our native culture and more in international uh, content to see when we keep learning good things, keep learning with kindness, friend, uh, how to make friends and how to be polite. But everybody now from kid to grandparents uh, are fighting for freedom, not, not just from February 24, but from, from Maidan from Orange Revol Revolution, so they can, too, they can do it too if they want to, but if they don't, we need we don't need to help them. It's my opinion. Yeah. Right. Raphael, have the other questions come in off the chat or any place else or anybody that's watching have a question? I, I see a very interesting question, which again, I don't have the answer, but maybe you can help me. So an anonymous at ND said that uh, my teenager is participating in pen pal Ukraine, and she's not asking about her pen pals experience in the war. She's trying to talk with her uh, pen pals about things that are less stressful. And so the question here is, would it be advisable for uh, teenagers or adults uh, from other countries who participate in pen pal to sort of try to find out more about the war side when they talk to their Ukrainian pen pals or try to stay off the sort of stressful topics and use more sort of normal everyday topics. And I honestly don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I see value in sort of both approaches, but I wonder you as educators with experience, what would be your sort of recommendation here? If I may offer an opinion on this. Uh, we just heard uh, Yulia uh, about uh, her view that uh, kids uh, need to be open to the uh, culture of the world. And uh, especially because uh, uh, right now, uh, she uh, joins probably millions of, of uh, parents who don't want their kids to uh, talk Russian, to uh, get into the Russian culture, contemporary Russian culture. Uh, then apparently it is better to uh, discuss uh, things that are more universal uh, less stressful because people are under daily stress already. Uh, adding uh, to this stress and asking them to relieve this uh, difficult time uh, may further suppress their psychological state. That is why, in my humble opinion, it makes sense to, uh, to talk about uh, things uh, of the outer world beyond the, the current war. Not ignoring the war, just focusing on many other developments around the world. My two cents. Thank you, Greg. Artem or Oleg, you want to make a comment on uh, the pen pals discussing the war with the children of Ukraine? Hi, and I, I see also Natalia and Leilani right there. Thank you very much. for give some, some words about considering these points. What I see now from people who already escaped and from people who remained is that uh, the majority is now suffering from post-traumatic syndrome. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, this is what we see. So uh, involving students, involving young people to, um, to discuss so traumatic uh, things, I mean, it is extremely hard even for professional psychologists. Psychologists in Europe are not ready. Uh, our Ukrainian psychologists are now passing the trainings to be ready to work with um, these sort of problems. Just now we have the problems with panic attacks. We have the problems with uh, anxiety. We have lots of problems, um, psychological, maybe even uh, psychiatric uh, problems. So I totally agree uh, with those who say that um, better avoid. Because uh, if don't, the kids will start to share the experience, expecting the correct feedback and not having exact knowledge how to react may create uh, the bigger harm uh, to them. 
this is what I think. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Artem, you want to go ahead, Artem? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would like to say that um, uh, considering the uh, situation with uh, Russian culture and Russian language, I think it's uh, now in Ukraine two different things. Because uh, if we talk about the Russian culture, the Russian totally lost our country. And uh, for our kids, uh, even uh, Russian language, uh, Russian spoken kids, uh, the Russian culture is totally strange and uh, it's not interesting. And uh, the, in the future, I think this gap, this uh, uh, indifference uh, will be more and more significant. Uh, according to the fact of uh, changing the language, it's a very uh, complicated question because for many people, uh, language, even Russian, unfortunately, is a part of their identity. And uh, people may be uh, Ukrainian patriots and even support U Ukrainization, uh, but uh, still uh, continue to talk in Russian. It's a different thing. It's a totally uh, brain uh, uh, busting. Uh, it's a totally uh shocking scene for the people from the, the western part of ukraine for example but it's a rather widespread scene here in the eastern ukraine and in the south of ukraine and uh, i think that uh, the process of uh, changing the language culture uh, will last uh, for a few decades and even then, it will be uh, rather by uh, the uh, bilingual culture. Uh, but I hope that the Ukrainian will be the dominant language here. Um, and uh, what about the kids? Uh, I think, uh, and I see that uh, our uh, children, they uh, uh, can, uh, if they meet Russians in some uh, online games, uh, games they uh, continue to um, how to say they continue to uh, uh, <coughs> behave uh, uh, in such way that they uh, consider Russians as uh, an enemy. So. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, I think it's uh, the main result of uh, the Russian, in Russian invasion. Even in the eastern and southern uh, regions, uh, Russian will be the nation of enemies for the nearest uh, years and probably for the dozens of years. Thank you, Artem. I, I, Leilani, I see your hand up, and then right after Leilani, I, Mati, I saw on the discussion board you're going to talk about the approach in Finland. Go ahead, Leilani. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry that I'm driving in the car, um, but I do have a couple of concerns. Uh, one, as the director of the X Culture Academy, we manage uh, students from ages as young as 10 years old, and then, of course, all the way up to 18. And um, we have currently 20 academy students in Ukraine, and they are, many of them are living in shelters or are in, um, in, in bunkers or refugee camps. Um, I am dealing with not just the concern of the students in Ukraine, but also the participants in those teams. Uh, not only that, but I also have young coaches under the age of 18 who are advising them and managing them, and we are all doing the very best that we can. Um, in addition to making sure that they are 
uh, being flexible with uh, timing and time zones and access to internet. I've also asked our ambassadors, or I'm sorry, our coaches and, and the students in the teams to be more uh, gentle with our uh, Ukrainian students and also to be more um, open to have conversations of things that are outside of the X culture project because it does alleviate a lot of the stress that our students go through. My concern, um, and this question is going to be directed actually to Natalia and, and Oleg, is how much of a conversation should my teenagers be having with each other regarding the, the war without, um, without excluding Ukrainians and their feelings. And um, I've also directed a lot of um, our younger students to have parents involved in some of those conversations. And is that something that we should be promoting that should you have these kinds of hard conversations with each other to maybe involve a parent to help you navigate through those concepts? Thank you for your time. And Natalia and Oleg, if you could answer that. And um, Again, to my Ukrainian colleagues, I'm very, very, um, I'm very, very heartbroken for your country, and I hope that this war will end soon. I right, carefully, Leilani. Thank you, Leilani. Thank you. Oleg, you want to try to answer that? Then Natalia next. Oleg, uh, there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for first, uh, I wanted to comment the issue about Russian language in Ukraine. Because, uh, frankly speaking, I now work at school, uh, which uh, only nine years ago was school with Russia language of teaching. So we have a lot of students here, still have a lot of students uh, who uses who use English uh, Russia uh, during you know uh, breaks between lessons and. Uh, with com in communication with friends but it's not a so big problem for us and for school because we use only ukrainian language at lessons and if some students uh, want to communicate in russia yes we can tolerate that uh, and we tolerate that indeed uh, but i generally believe and our school administration believe as well that for the general good of ukraine you know uh, it's better for us in long-term perspective to use Ukrainian language. So, yeah, and uh, uh, I'm sorry I had some communication problems uh, when uh, Leilani asked her question, so if you can repeat. <laughs> yeah, I think our, our question was related to the students in the academy. So a little bit younger than some yes. of the students. Um, Sorry, my question, is, I don't know, Tim, if you can hear me. My question is um, with regards to addressing a lot of the um, non-ex-culture project related topics. Again, what I've done is encouraged my students to allow the conversation to happen. And I've also instructed the, the coaches to, you know, when those conversations do happen and, um, and it becomes heated or it becomes escalated to involve a parent or a teacher or an adult to help them navigate through those concepts. What other tools do I need to, to teach my coaches to utilize so that we can get through this together? I don't want them to avoid the topic. I think that's the wrong decision because we are experiencing it in the present moment and, and avoiding the topic, I think, is, is just burying it and not ne necessarily working through it. But what other tools can I utilize for all of my young students? And that's not just Ukrainian students, but they're, they're a teammate, uh, our coaches who are also, most of them are underage, what else can I do to make this better for everybody as we go through it together? That's my question. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Now I understood. So yeah, I believe that it's 
important issue. And I believe that, as you said, we don't, uh, we have to speak about it. We don't need to, you know, forbid that kind of uh, discussion. If some students want to, you know, communicate about this Russian-Ukrainian conflict, uh, in, uh, it's not, it's not should be forbidden for them. Uh, but I know uh, I'm not ready to answer directly your question about tools, uh, some specific tools. Uh, I believe that the main tool with which we should use it's uh, open resources with check it, uh, clear information about this war. And it would be better for all of us and for students as well to use only such resources, not you know any Russian uh, propaganda, only uh, <clears throat> only uh, general worldwide resources or Ukrainian resources. And in that case, uh, students of X culture will know any basic and uh, my, uh, any basic information about this war. I believe that that's the main tool so for avoiding such conflicts thank you Oleg. and, and uh, i think it was mate from finland you want to say a few words about the, the view from finland with what's going on in ukraine I think we, need to, we need to promote uh just a second yeah okay but he should be able to talk in a second mm -hmm. There's also maybe while Maria is joining us, there is an interesting question from one of the attendees um, that the person says on social media, I see mixed opinions about the leadership of President Zelensky. Just curious how the natives are perceiving Zelensky's, Zelensky's approach to the situation. Uh, so I'm, I'm also curious because I hear and see primarily very positive views of him from Ukrainians. But those of you in Ukraine, what is your impression about Zelensky or what do you see your friends and neighbors say about his approach, his leadership? Well, I will start and probably my colleagues uh, will continue. Well, as for me, I uh, change uh, my uh, attitude to Mr. Zelensky from rather skeptical before the war. Uh, to uh, more favorite because uh, first of all I didn't expect it from him that uh, he will sell their own during this such situation yeah and uh, there was uh, a risk that uh, Ukraine agreed to some uh, peace uh, uh, um, armistices yeah or uh, president may flee uh, from the capital, but uh, he stayed and he continued to, to uh, fight, and this is good. Uh, considering the uh, people whom I know, the very different, uh, mm, the very different thoughts in general, all agree that now we may uh, support our president. It's the main idea. But uh, there are also people who criticize him, uh, mostly criticize because uh, uh, I think uh, since uh, 29 till the 22, uh, most uh, financing uh, were directed to the infrastructure projects. So we really uh, saw the, uh, really have seen the changes, so the good roads, the highways, new airports, uh, new schools, but uh, it was uh, uh, due to the uh, less uh, money to the defense. And uh, some people now criticize him because uh, he didn't pay enough attention to the uh, military uh, preparation and to the defense preparation. Uh, but in general, in general, the uh, attitude to him, I, I may say it's positive. Uh, and uh, all the all the questions, all the uh, critics uh, postpone their uh, opinions uh, till the time after the war. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Natalia or Oleg, you want well, to? May I, may I say some words? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, we've got a president in the past, Leonid Kuchma, and he wrote the famous book that was titled Ukraine is not Russia. So the main fundamental difference between uh, Ukrainians and Russians is uh, is well seen after elections and is well seen towards uh, our attitude uh, to our presidents. So for Ukrainians, so Ukrainians go and uh, vote for the president. They may be even support very much the president. The day after, we start to criticize him. Russians go and vote for their president. The day after, they start to draw, I don't know, icons and uh, praying for uh, the president. So it, he becomes a sort of a tsar. And that is the fundamental difference. So that means that uh, if now we support Zelensky, that doesn't mean that tomorrow we will not start to criticize him. The, the day after tomorrow, he will do something else and we will say, okay, he has done a, a good thing. I mean, it's a, a normal democracy, I suppose. <laughs> and considering the previous questions about um, the language, the attitude, uh, the, the what should we do in communications, I will give you two examples. Two real life examples. As I have said, my smallest kid uh, is now attending the Italian school. So the first example, the first day uh, she came, she obviously uh, knew just uh, ciao and nothing else. So she went to the school and teachers were using Google Translate. So you may easily understand that they were using Google Translate from Italian to Ukrainian. They had no idea to put a uh, Russian language. Another small example is just that happened just yesterday. My kid has brought uh, the notebook from the school. She was making some exercises. And among those exercises, there was a lovely picture of two kids. They were hugging and uh, they were standing with two flags. One flag was Ukrainian and another one was Russian. And it was written something like pace in tutto il mondo, meaning uh, peace in all the world. Uh, we were mm, so angry and we were trying to, to find a normal way to explain to the teachers why they were wrong. Meaning we have the Russian language and we have Russia, and we have all the attributes of the state, of the Russian states, like flags, like symbols, like Z that they uh, write in the tanks and uh, in all other places. So to my, uh, to my mind, uh, the world uh, does not understand uh, clearly where is this a borderline between two kids hugging and pace and two kids hugging with two flags of uh, uh, two countries and the second country is Russia. All those questions are very much complicated, really are very much complicated and uh, give some suggestion what could we do with kids. Uh, we should, according to me, we should not, I mean, uh, European American kids should not try to to start that communication or to force Ukrainian kids to tell their story to share their story because then uh, they will face the story of uh, bombs falling in of people killed they will share the story of Bucha or something like that and adults really don't know what to do with all those they don't know what to say and normality from the psychological point of view is now to feel depression on one day and uh, um, some, I don't know, euphoria in another day. The, the, the feelings that uh, in the, let's say, normal day we will call uh, bipolar disorder is now the normal reaction of a normal person to the war. So this is what we're talking about. Maybe we need to involve psychologists, but maybe we need to involve Ukrainian psychologists 
to explain because we need to be prepared. The teachers of my kid asked me what does uh, what did uh, uh, she she see in Ukraine? Meaning murders, meaning uh, tanks. What? Unfortunately, she saw um, not so many things. So the most traumatic uh, experience was the the trip. 24 hours standing. So psychologist, I suppose we need to, to talk to experts in this sphere and mostly experts from, uh, from Ukraine, experts who know who, who had suffered the same, who has lived the same experience. This is what I think, thank you. Natalia got it right when she said uh, you know, regarding the president, presidency. So the scary things uh, in Ukraine is that nobody knows who's going to be the next Ukrainian president. But the scary thing in Russia is that everybody knows exactly who's going to be the next president. So, uh, Mati is here uh, from Finland. Um, I believe I wanted to ask him to say a few words uh, how the whole thing is seen from Finland. Thank you all. So Matti Hidnes is my name and I come from Jamk University of Central Finland. And I am not directly involved with ex-culture, but we have Stephen and Barbara Crawford who have been actively uh, involved in the ex-culture. But Stephen shared me the link and I was so curious to join. So thank you for the opportunity. And I think that uh, did Elenurm address the straight question to us Finns and I, I tried to say something. Of course, the first part, the schools, we don't have the same situation as you do to have that big uh, uh, Russian population so that there would be schools specifically for Russian speakers and Finnish speakers. Uh, we might have some school in the Helsinki area, I'm not sure, but in the big picture, so the Russian minority is something like 50, 60,000 in Finland out of the 5 million, so it's not that big. But, uh, uh, so in that sense, the schooling question is, you know, out of uh, beyond my my uh, skills. But the other question is that: what about accepting the students to the universities? Uh, what happened to us is that historically, our university we haven't we haven't had we have had hardly, also we haven't had hardly any uh, students from Ukraine, but big number of Russian students, and of course they are part of our community, so we have to take care of them. Because what is important in our community and also the city and Finland is the is the uh, social stability. So you don't want we don't want to see any confrontation anywhere. Not in classes in university. Not in pubs and bars and restaurants. Not in the street. Because the social stability and let's say internal peace in that sense is is very important. And actually, what I did, I quite soon we opened a special forum to take care of our Russian students because there is a risk that something might happen by them or for them. And that could be, be bad, bad in many ways. Uh, and also, if you think about the official Finland, so this is last week where both our president and the prime minister, they announced a statement. I can't remember it literally, but the idea of the statement was to say that all we who live in Finland, not addressing to us Finns, but all who live in Finland, we should work for the Finland. So that the, the, the statement was really addressed in the way that we should unite. We don't care where you're from, but if you have the residence permit, if you have our passport, you should work for us under the current circumstances. And of course, you might know that much of the history that we have had special cases with our dear Eastern neighbor, with whom we have 1,300 kilometers of shared border. And we have certain uh, suspicion, a suspicious attitude, or, or almost in our genes. So, but, but the, of course, everybody here was shocked. Nobody really believed that this would happen. And of course, the question has been, okay, what's gonna happen next? Are we the next target? Theoretically, yes. But for some reason, we don't see a high probability uh, for something to happen. It may happen, of course, but we live normal life here. We don't take into account that much what's going on. 
and also when talking with new students. So our official policy <laughs> is that we just had entrance exams. We accept the students normal way. Last week we sent the invitations, they are welcome to come. And we have our immigration authority and the board of control to check their backgrounds. If they have the right to come to Finland, they are welcome. That's in a nutshell, but Barbara, Stephen, if you want to say that's something from your perspective, feel free. Thank you for the time. Yeah, you've been here. You've been. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, I see several people raise their hands, uh, but I also see that we are greatly over time. So I'm not sure if the hosts want to allow time for one more question or should we wrap up? Yeah, my, my thought, boss, is this, is let's take the questions. If, if anybody's got to go, they please feel free okay, to drop good. off. But okay. it seems as to be very good. Okay. Yeah, very good conversation. So let's take the question. Then, if I may, then, if I would like, uh, I would like to make a statement. So following Maris, uh, uh, Tietz, uh, uh, Natalia's uh, comments, I see we have also here friends from uh, Ernesto from Italy. Uh, so we have people from pretty much all around the world. Um, I don't know how Ukraine uh, can and will thank all the countries who provide support. But I do see that uh, without the support of our both European, but also American, Canadian friends, the whole world essentially, Ukraine would be in a much, much um, you know, worse situation. And uh, so I also know that while Ukraine is taking the main hit, and so Ukraine is paying with its uh, own you know, lives and blood for, uh, for Russia's aggression. I do also recognize that everybody, especially the Europeans are paying some price as well. So the 5 million people in Europe definitely are creating strain on the infrastructure, on the schools, on the system. I see the help flowing uh, into Ukraine from the military equipment to money, to uh, humanitarian aid uh, from bigger countries, from smaller countries. Uh, so from you know little countries like Slovakia all the way to the large countries like the United Kingdom. Uh, so all of them are providing the support. And so um, I guess on behalf of Ukraine, even though I'm not in Ukraine, uh, a big thank you to that support. And I hope there will be an opportunity for Ukraine to properly thank uh, for all this work. I also recognize that many of these countries, including Finland, for example, or Estonia, uh, or Poland for that matter, recognize that they could be the next. And in a way, Ukrainians are fighting for the whole world and, uh, and holding the border uh, on behalf of the whole of Europe. But again, all that support, all that help is extremely important and critical. More is needed, definitely. Uh, but what's being provided now is also hugely appreciated. Yeah, I, I can't see. Some, somebody else have their hand up to ask a question? Uh, no one now. I can't okay. see anyone. Um, sorry for interrupting again. Uh, hey, Wall hey, is Wall. now joining. So uh, we yeah. are here to say uh, thanks for everybody. And um, we will keep standing with all your support and we will, we will win soon. Just so, you can, so. just so you all can appreciate what these two people are doing. Uh, so over the last six weeks, uh, very often when I call them and say, well, when, when Monday update will be done, or uh, did you send out the weekly uh, performance review to the professors? In many cases, I call them and they say, just give us another hour. It's an aerial attack. We are sitting in a bomb shelter or in the hallway because that protects them from the windows in case something explodes. We'll be right back online. Just give us about an hour. And I don't know, it is a big deal. It, it is, you know, it is scary. It is hard to work during this time. But those two people, those three people, because the little research assistant there is helping all the time as well. <laughs> so they, they, as somebody said, soldiered through. So they, they powered through and uh, sometimes crying, yep. uh, sometimes laughing, sometimes uh, just, you know, getting, getting to work and, and doing the work. So thank you so much, guys. Hey, Julie and Val, why don't you let your daughter talk? She's too shy. Hey, baby. She's too shy. <laughs> so, sometimes she would be singing and jumping. Sometimes she would be crying. So it's been a very difficult few weeks. Truly, Love now her. she's overwhelmed because we uh, spent um, like in 24 hours on the way home. So it was yesterday and she's too, she's too tired. So sorry, she will not join. <laughs> I love her Minnie Mouse hat. That's very cute. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much for everything. 
Um, there is a very difficult question, and I'm not even sure if I would like to bring it up. Uh, there is a question from Sean Reed, and so I'll, I'll open it, but I'm not sure if anyone has a good answer. So Sean is asking here um, about uh, anti-Putin pro-Ukrainian Russians in Russia. So many of them apparently are trying to leave the country. Not all of them can. I did mention to you my conversations with the professors from Russia, you know, some of them. Again, I will refrain from calling their names. In fact, they asked to delete our conversations in Facebook out of fear that the KGB may be checking their social media, but they are more anti-Putin than I am. And so um, uh, the question here is, what should be the attitudes uh, towards Ukraine, I mean, to, towards Russians who are definitely not supporting Putin, who may be living overseas already or who are trying to leave? How do you recon reconcile um, the attitudes towards the Russian war machine versus the Russian citizens who perhaps oppose that war machine as much as any Ukrainian or anyone else. And again, I don't have the answer to that question. I, I, you know, I have my feelings here, but I also have some thoughts here and sometimes that at conflict. So I, I don't really know what the correct answer would be. All the way to the point, and we've had many heated discussions with Julia, and I think uh, she, she was not entirely in an agreement with me but I was saying things like through our work, we can actually um, have some effect on the public opinion in Russia. And as I was saying, maybe even prepare some form of insurgency against Putin. And so I almost see my, my, my role and mission to, to help them uh, stay connected to the West and uh, resist the, the oppression in Russia. Uh, uh, Julia's response was, no, I don't wanna have anything to do with them anymore. I was tolerant uh, even in 2014, but not anymore. So, but I'm not sure what would be your views. It's, it's a very difficult question. I wonder if any of you have, have any opinion just so that at least the audience know um, um, what you think. Again, I'm not sure if there is one single correct answer here. If I, may, I actually expressed my view already. Uh, indeed, uh, one is such a very emotional, uh, reaction uh, against aggressor, but uh, in long term, I think uh, uh, it's more dangerous to make from Russia a new uh, North Korea, and especially if uh, Russia will change, it will change through these Russians who are part of the Western community, and if we isolate even such people completely, then actually we are implementing the agenda of Putin because that is what he wants to do. That's 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 a popular opinion among many people. So yes, um, I see Natalia and Greg also have their hands raised. Okay, two stories. I'm a storyteller <laughs> today. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's start from the, the positive one. Um, as I have said, uh, I'm now physically in Italy, and there are lots of Russians here, obviously. And so the answer uh, to the question is quite simple. Everything depends on the attitude. So if you meet a Russian and uh, he or she says something like, I'm ashamed of my country, and I absolutely uh, think that it is like the, the black day, the black month, the black time for my country. It is okay. You may communicate, you may discuss, you may share information. And another, um, another story, um, I've got cousins in Moscow and they are half uh, Ukrainian and half Russians. And we have 40, 40 something days of war passed and I have not received any message from them. So this is the another story. So it is from one side, a very simple question. From another side, a very complicated question because I'm uh, waiting for the day when the whole Russia will suddenly uh, wake up. It is like in books of Strugatsky, suddenly these towels will fall and they will understand everything and they will wake up and they will say, ah, oh, 
we 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 were wrong. That was Putin, and they will start to blame Putin as previously they blamed Stalin. And it is a good question what uh, we should do then. We should say, ah, oh, okay, we understand you. It was just a propaganda, poor fellow. You were suffering so much. Or what should we do? Because uh, uh, any psychologist will uh, say that the person firstly choose what to believe and then search for the information supporting his or her opinion. Thank you. Greg, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, join Natalia's uh, uh, sentiment, uh, but uh, with a little bit more information. Uh, I uh, speak from time to time to uh, our old friends in Moscow. Old, I mean that my parents started to, uh, became friends with their parents in 1953. So you could, the generational thing. They signed the no war uh, statement on the first day on the 24th of February. And they told me that uh, they stopped communicating with many of their friends who supported the war because they could not find any common ground anymore with them. And when I asked a naive question how I could support them, they said, your call is the greatest support. Your uh, willingness to communicate with us is the greatest support of our will to withstand evil. That is why I want to make sure that we do not uh, put all people who are Russians by citizenship into one big basket and say they're all bad, they're all evil. There are many people and some of them unfortunately are jailed for uh, their Brave, uh, um, brave actions to to withstand the tyrannical and uh, uh, dictator uh, dictatorship uh, regime of uh, Putin. How many of them? How uh, difficult is for them to express their opinion? Is uh, a big question because, as we know, many uh, uh, many. Uh, media sources, including Facebook, uh, are banned. YouTube is banned. Google has uh, some mixed uh, uh, acceptance. And this means that people who want to uh, express their opinion and support for the uh, Ukrainian side of the war are deprived of this. And everyone else is brainwashed constantly 24-7 with Russian propaganda. Uh, this is something that uh, we need to understand and there is no single answer. And I agree with both uh, Tate and uh, Natalia that we need to, to see how we, we could find reasonable people, how we could support them because otherwise they would feel abandoned. They will feel uh, alone in the sea of uh, hatred and we will not give them uh, what they deserve for their reasonable and uh, sober view of the world. After the war, we will be very much, uh, we will be very gentle. We will become very much understandable after the war. Right. Or as they say now in Ukraine, after the victory, not after the war, after the victory. <laughs> Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know Voss has got to go here in a few few minutes. Uh, are there any final questions before we wrap this up? I see a lot of comments of support and, and compassion. Thank you so much. Uh, that is very much needed. Um, I also know based on the comments and my private conversations with many of the participants here, I know that some people um, are extremely pro-Ukrainian and anti-Russian and some may have some let's call them mixed feelings or perhaps see a larger picture. Um, but at the same time, even those who have mixed feelings, again, I, I will not be naming the names, they do provide a lot of support, uh, stipends to Ukrainian students, uh, hosting Ukrainian refugees, and that's what matters. So I know everybody is suffering by paying you know, higher prices for the gas 
or by perhaps you know uh, seeing uh, the infrastructure overwhelmed. Uh, Poland, for example, I was extremely touched when Julia told me that they allowed Ukrainian kids in, in the schools. They made public transportation free for Ukrainians. Uh, food, um, Julia told the story when she was in the uh, mall and the kid fell asleep and then immediately the police officers showed up and said, hey, would you, do you need a place to stay? They thought maybe that, you know, they, so there is a lot of support and that's extremely not only touching, you know, psychologically important, but also uh, it is real, huge, tangible help. So thank you very much for all that. Uh, um, it's a difficult situation. Nobody wanted to be in this situation, but uh, we are in this and it matters a big deal that we are all in it together. Even little things like, for example, Bon Jovi, John Bon Jovi was um, having a concert in our city yesterday. And so my friends, professors from my school went to the concert and then like at 11 p.m., text me and say, hey, Bon Jovi just dedicated uh, It's My Life, the song to Ukraine. So here is a little text for you. It, it matters, it, it does provide support. So thank you very much everyone for that support. Obviously we would be doing even better if there was more uh, military support to Ukraine so that we can stand together. Because again, going back to what Natalia said after the war, it all depends on how it will end. Uh, so it's, there are legitimate concerns that um, if Ukraine keeps on fighting, there will be more casualties. Or if Russia folds and then falls apart into 50 pieces, you'll have 50 rogue states with nuclear weapons. You know, that's dangerous. There are concerns that if NATO or Poland or the United Kingdom or the United States go full in, uh, push, Putin will start pressing the red button and then uh, nobody wants to see a nuclear bomb falling on Rome or on, on Warsaw. At the same time, if uh, uh, Ukraine will be allowed to fall and Putin occupies Ukraine, uh, the consequences can also be very, very dire for the entire world. Uh, we may be back to where we were during the Cold War times. We don't know what the reaction of Russia's allies, uh, other big countries further to the east without naming them, what their reaction will be. So it is a very chaotic situation and uh, it's one of those systems that is essentially unpredictable. So uh, I do believe uh, somebody mentioned uh, Ukrainian lives and Ukraine with, I mean, Russia withdrawing from Ukraine. But then again, who's going to pay for all the destruction? I mean, we're talking about essentially all the roads bombed. Uh, R10 is extremely brave, so, but I just re read the report. So the airport in Dnipro was destroyed today. So we are talking about literally a few kilometers away. Again, who's going to pay for that? I don't know how much money is an airport worth a uh, billion dollars more. Uh, you know, people, uh, lives, the, the stress, for example, again, Julia perhaps didn't tell that explicitly, but I see when we talk on the phone for the video, Vira is playing in the background and then something drops and the sound and the kid immediately, you know, looks at you. So all that PTSD, it's going to last for a while. And so who's going to pay for that? Even a little thing, I mean, I'll tell you this, you know, I, I'm relatively active on Facebook and I put, you know, posts at any time, any time. And I used to normally post things, let's say at 9 p.m. my time, which is like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in Ukraine. And normally if I did that two months ago, nobody would react to them for, for several hours until the Ukrainians start waking up. Yesterday, I put something at about 3 a.m. Ukrainian time the number of likes permitted is exactly the same as during the daytime, which tells me most Ukrainians are just simply not sleeping. I'm not sure if they're compulsively check checking the news or scrolling through the news feed or simply so anxious that they cannot fall asleep. But again, that does have all that health uh, effect, does have economic effect as well. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to restore that? So these are very, very difficult in turn time, and I have no idea what kind of solution would be um, a definitive and final solution. What worries me most is that it will stop like it stopped in 2014 with some sort of a paper signed, but then Putin stays in power, Russia stays in parts of Ukraine, Ukraine sort of retreats to some new lines. In that case, I'm afraid it will just, we will be back to the new escalation, new wave of escalation in a few years. So that probably will be the most a uh, dangerous solution because it will just simply give the time for Russia to recoup and then who's gonna, who knows what's gonna happen then in a few more years. So, so anyway, a very difficult situation with no simple solution that I see on the horizon. So. Thank you very much, Moss, for uh, organizing this. And uh, thank you to all the speakers for sharing your opinion with us.
Thank you everyone for joining and uh, thank you everyone who was watching and uh, thank you so much for your support. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Yeah. As they say in Ukraine, Slava Ukraini. So glory to Ukraine and the answer these days is. Heroyam Slava. Thank you. Thank you.